So I said, shall I talk with the camera or shall I talk with you? Shift across the middle. Yeah. I'm Benjamin and I'm working at Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. I'm a researcher working in the land use group of the uh, institute and we are doing uh, basically research on how agriculture influences the climate and how climate influences agriculture. My personal interest is how the nitrogen cycle will evolve into the future. Maybe we can start by asking a very simple question. What's the in your opinion, the most important invention, let's say, of the last 200 years? Is it maybe computer, the car, what else could it be, television, nuclear power? My personal opinion is that um, the most important uh, invention is the Haber-Bosch synthesis. Some of you probably heard about this in, in chemistry lessons. My argument is that without this process, this chemical process, our world population would be uh, one-third lower. At the same time, probably, there would be uh, much less wars on this planet. Nitrogen is a pretty big deal. I have it, you have it, this plant, this cat, this bacterium has it. Every living thing on this planet needs nitrogen to live, grow and reproduce. It's in every DNA molecule, in every protein, and if you don't know by now, DNA and protein are pretty much what makes every living organism tick. So yes, nitrogen is a pretty big deal. So how do we get nitrogen? We eat food that contains nitrogen, things like meat and plants, and we get our meat from animals who also eat plants. So if animals like humans and cows can get their nitrogen from plants, where do the plants get their nitrogen from? They get it from the soil. All pretty simple stuff until you find out that nitrogen isn't very abundant in most soils, often to the point where plant growth is limited by nitrogen availability. So where does that nitrogen come from in the first place? So if you want to have plant growth on this planet, then you need reactive nitrogen as a basic ingredient. As you might know, the air we breathe is um, 69% nitrogen. Um, uh, and you might think, okay, if something is like as abundant as this, um, how can it be a problem? The problem is that the air we breathe, we cannot use. It's um, uh, basically stuck in a triple bound compound, N2. And uh, this triple bound is very strong and it needs a lot of energy to, to split it up and to make it into reactive nitrogen. But it can be done using an enzyme called nitrogenase. Nitrogenase is produced by a group of specialised microorganisms, particular bacteria and cyanobacteria, and has the ability to break the strong triple covalent bond in dinitrogen molecules. This microbial process of making reactive nitrogen from inert dinitrogen is called biological nitrogen fixation. How does this process play out? Well, dinitrogen, which is readily available in our atmosphere, is absorbed by nitrogen-fixing microbes, which produce nitrogenase to break the triple covalent bond and attach three hydrogen atoms, creating a compound called ammonia. Ammonia is a reactive form of nitrogen, but it's generally microbially transformed to other reactive inorganic nitrogen forms like ammonium and nitrate to be used by other organisms in the ecosystem, such as plants and other microbes. They use these nitrogen forms for organic molecules like DNA and protein. Nitrogen can even be lost back to the atmosphere as dinitrogen or other more detrimental gases like nitrous oxide. So clearly biological nitrogen fixation is a really important ecological process. But the reason why every organism on this planet doesn't do it themselves is because it's really energy intensive. A nitrogen fixing microbe requires at least 16 moles of adenosine triphosphate ATP, to reduce a mole of nitrogen, which means they need an ample food source to keep this process going. Cyanobacteria can produce their own sugars through photosynthesis, but not all microbes are so lucky. One group of bacteria, broadly referred to as rhizobia, can form a symbiotic relationship with certain plant families, such as Fabaceae, which includes legumes. This symbiosis relies on the plant providing a safe home and a food source for the rhizobia, and in return, 
the rhizobio produces reactive nitrogen for the plant. Plants that have an active symbiosis with rhizobia form these funky nodulated roots, and it's inside these nodules where the bacteria live and fix nitrogen. In many natural ecosystems where nitrogen is a limiting nutrient, it is these plants that play a critical role in fixing nitrogen for the other organisms to access. But what about man-made systems like agriculture? Basically, the nature is restricted to a large amount by having not enough nitrogen. And not also the nature, but also agriculture. You, you needed a lot of management practices to, to still harvest this nitrogen. In the beginning, it was mainly harvesting nitrogen, which was there by nature. So basically, you were cultivating a field, and you wait, were waiting until the nitrogen in the soil was depleted. And then you moved on to the next field. The next invention, kind of, was a slash and burn. So you basically burned the vegetation on it, the nitrogen which was stored in there was delivered to plants and you could have a shifting cultivation where you basically moved from one plot to another and always get the nitrogen. The next big agricultural revolution was then um, uh, crop rotations. And then you could permanently use the same field. Uh, like that you needed much less area because you didn't have to move, you could also build cities. Um, uh, settle down. Also a lot of other cultivation practices are connected to nitrogen. One of the original German words for cow is Mistvieh, basically because you didn't have it for its meat but uh, for its manure. So uh, the, basically one big function of the cow was to collect nitrogen and other nutrients from the pasture and then you use the manure to fertilize your fields. All this improved um, the productivity of agriculture but uh, still it was very limited. So leguminous had smaller crop yields. You could you cannot permanently grow leguminous on the same on the same field. So in the beginning of the 19th century, there was a big debate going on uh, in Europe about can we actually uh, feed the planet? Will we not be uh, limited, or will population growth not soon be limited by uh, nitrogen? And in that phase already, they people started to mine nitrogen. So basically there were ships going to South America um, uh, to, to mine the guano reserves. And guano is basically um, a bird shit which accumulated over centuries. And of course this is a non-renewable resource, um, at least over short time scales. And these resources were rapidly depleting. There was another reason why uh, people were very eager to, to get nitrogen and that's because nitrogen is so energy intensive that it's, um, uh, it's basically in every explosive that exists on this world. So salpeter, for, made, used for gunpowder, is basically reactive nitrogen, but also modern explosives, TNT, nitroglycerine, everything is connected to nitrogen. Back then, the Germans had a problem that uh, basically they, they didn't have as many ships at the, as the English. And they thought, okay, what happens now if we want to start a world war, um, if we don't have enough nitrogen, and if the ships which bring us the guano from Latin America are stopped by the British. So they started a program to research on ways to get reactive nitrogen uh, um, uh, synthesized. And um, uh, so they turned on to another idea. It was basically Haber who discovered that you can synthesize um, nitrogen also based on natural gas. You just needed a certain catalyst. So basically Haber discovered this synthesis and uh, Bosch was the one who, who scaled it up to industrial scale. And um, uh, so the, the first fertilizer plant, it was back then not a fertilizer plant, but it was used for creating uh, ammunition, um, uh, was built uh, around 1910-1914 and just in time uh, to start a big war. So after that, basically the, the problem of scarcity of nitrogen in agriculture was solved, especially after the 1950s industrial production of um, nitrogen fertilizer became very cheap and it basically fostered what we call the green revolution in agriculture. 
So during the 1960s, 1970s, the, the crop yields went up by scales. And by now, now we have a quite a different uh, problem. The nitrogen, which used to be a scarce resource, is now abundant. So we've got <laughs> currently about eight times more nitrogen fixed through human activity than it was um, fixed through nature. A lot of this nitrogen goes into agricultural systems for crops to grow big and strong, but the problem is it doesn't always stay in agricultural systems and is often leached away into rivers and ocean basins or is lost as gases such as nitrous oxide, which by the way is a greenhouse gas with warming potential 298 times that of carbon dioxide. Uh huh. So what happens when natural systems tuned to work with limited nitrogen supply are exposed to high levels of nitrogen? So when you put a lot of nitrogen into a, into a system, it changes basically the whole network and the, the whole ecosystem. Often, for example, if you put a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus into water, then you get eutrophication. This means the small algae, um, which can convert um, sunlight very efficiently uh, to grow, basically outperform uh, more complex organisms. And they, you get algae blooms, in the night, um, uh, the algae blooms are eaten up, sink to the ground, deplete um, uh, the ocean of oxygen, and you've got large-scale hypoxic, anoxic conditions in large parts of, um, uh, of the river basins. For example, the, the Baltic Sea, there is an area of 11,000 to, uh, well, several, several thousand of square kilometers depleted of oxygen. And this, of course, has dramatic effects on, on the productivity of these systems. Basically, our projections for the nitrogen cycle for the future um, state that nitrogen pollution will most likely further increase into the future. So the, the, the largest driver of this is population growth. And of course, you need to feed this population. And as I said, nitrogen is a basic ingredient of nutrition and you cannot replace it by something else. So basically if you have a higher population you also need more nitrogen to feed it. Um, uh, the challenge then is okay what can we do to mitigate um, nitrogen pollution and if you look at the literature the ideas which so far exist there are basically four major fields where you can where you can uh, improve the nitrogen footprint. This is first of all reduce food waste on households and uh, also recycle the food waste which still is there back on fields. Second part is you can reduce your livestock consumption. Livestock requires multiple proteins for one livestock protein. So if you become vegan, um, uh, you, you have a much lower nitrogen footprint. The next um, uh, step is having the livestock you still have fed more efficiently and you should also try to recycle the manure of the animals back to fields. This is a problem for example with large-scale industrial livestock farming um, that in Europe at least they have problems of getting rid of their nitrogen surplus so they, they sometimes have to, to transport it for several hundred kilometers to find a spot where they can still put it on the pasture. And the last point is more efficient fertilization on the field. There's a basic rule. If you fertilize the right amount of fertilizer on the right place and the right time, then you reduce nitrogen losses. So multiple applications or measuring on the ground how much nitrogen you actually need can improve a lot on that.